In this segment, we're going to talk about sales techniques. Now, right from the start, let me say that we're not going to suggest that there is only one way to sell. There is no such thing as a fixed presentation. Out there on the selling floor, you become a lot like the improvisational actor. By definition, improvisational actors are people who are given a subject or suggestion by the audience and then proceed to create a sketch or scene without any prepared script or plot. Uh, they simply wing it, as they say. Obviously, because they've been doing improvisational theater for some time, they've developed routines and methods of handling some of the oddball suggestions that come from the audiences. Well, you've got a lot in common with those actors. Even though you know the product, there's no set script. The customer is going to throw some oddball suggestions at you, and you have to be ready to deal with whatever they come up with. However, at the same time, you have the opportunity to exert a great deal of control over this selling situation. And one of the objectives of this program is to show you how to do exactly that. And the first step in showing you how to control the selling situation is to give you a different perspective on selling. A perspective that will show you how to identify a prospect's true buying motives and then to structure a sales presentation to take full advantage of this vital information. As you'll see, once you know the customer's buying motives, you'll have little trouble controlling the direction and flow of the sale. Enough introduction. Let's begin. The first thing you must understand is that almost every automobile sale eventually becomes a classic negotiation. By definition, a negotiation is an activity in which parties are trying to satisfy their individual needs. As a salesperson, your main objective is to persuade the customer that your product in this case a Mercedes-Benz, satisfies their automotive needs better than any other automobile. At the same time, you're trying to satisfy your need to earn a commission and turn a prospect into a source of repeat business and referrals. The best and most positive type of negotiation is what we call the win-win. In this type of negotiation, everyone leaves feeling that he or she has won. The customer has the automobile he or she wants, and you have the sale. You've both won, because you both have the sense of having satisfied personal needs. Keep this definition in mind, because it's fundamental to everything that follows. Now, let's see how this effort to satisfy needs fits into the structure of the classic automobile negotiation. Traditionally, when we talk about an automobile sale, we're talking about a set of well-defined steps. Meet and greet, probing and qualifying, selling benefits, demonstrating, handling objections, closing, delivery, and follow-up. Let's look at each of these steps in more detail. With each prospect that walks into the showroom, you have but one chance to make a good first impression. And a lot of that first impression will be determined by your attitude, the expression on your face, and by the way you're dressed. Needless to say, a pleasant expression and a professional appearance will go a long way toward creating a positive impression. The objective of the meet greet step is to begin the process of establishing trust. As you well know, this is an absolute must in our business. And with some customers, this may be one of the most difficult things to do. The reason is this. People who have been buying automobiles in the domestic market have been conditioned over the years to expect the worst from salespeople. Their experiences might range from salesmen who treated them without and out hostility to someone who was ready to promise anything to get the sale. Because of the quality of our automobiles, the tone of our advertising, and our overall image, most people expect to be treated differently in a Mercedes-Benz dealership. They assume that the quality of the automobile is also reflected in the people. So, in general, the prospects who walk through the front door expect better treatment, and it's up to you to confirm their expectations. Now, let's assume that you've got a smile on your face and you're dressed correctly. Obviously, the ideal situation would find you walking up to the customer, introducing yourself, and immediately have the customer tell you that he's looking to replace his three-year-old Mercedes. Occasionally, that's exactly what happens. Unfortunately, because many people approach buying an automobile as a potentially unpleasant experience, many salespeople find themselves in a dialogue that goes like this. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Donegan Smith, and welcome to Precision Motors. Uh, may I help you? Uh, no, thanks. I'm just looking. Or the conversation might go like this. Good morning. 
Thanks for coming in. My name is Donegan Smith. May I show you one of our automobiles? No, that's not necessary. I know what I'm looking for. I just uh, want your best price. We offer these illustrations to underscore the importance of a greeting which causes the customer to naturally flow into a spontaneous conversation. Obviously, you want to avoid the kind of response he just heard. So, what might you say? We put that question to several Mercedes-Benz salespeople and here's what they said. You really have the just looking response all the time. And you just keep on pursuing it. Say, well, what were you looking at? What are you thinking about? Um, just making the customer feel at ease. And a lot of times exchanging names does not make a customer feel at ease. Some customers will come in and they'll give you their name first. They'll walk up to you and say, hi, I'm John Jones. Sometimes I'll walk up to customers and do that. Sometimes I won't find out the customer's name for a half hour. It's, it's whatever you feel that's going to make the customer at ease and never have a canned opening greeting for a customer. It's, it, I think that's the most important thing. Don't get in the rut, hi, may I help you? It could be, hi, may I help you? Hi, good morning, how are you? Take a look at what he's driving outside. That's a pretty white Datsun 280Z that you're driving. How long have you had it? Anything, just to catch the customer a little bit off guard. They're always expecting, can I help you? My name is John Jones, what's your name? And I try to really pull a little bit of the reverse, get them to tell me their name. At that point, I think you're starting to control the situation a little bit better with some customers. Other customers you can't do that with. Well, first of all, I, I welcome them to Herb Gordon. And I extend my hand to all the people who I am. And then I ask them, what may I show you? And most of the time, rather than a customer say, well, I'm just looking, they'll tell me um, a particular model. Sometimes they'll be specific about if it's a 190 or a 300, or they'll tell me I'm looking for a four-door car or whatever. Once you've got the customer talking, you're ready to move on to the second step. Traditionally, when automobile people talk about probing and qualifying, they're talking about trying to determine things like which automobile the person is interested in, what kind of trade-in they have, does the spouse have to approve the purchase, is this to be a lease or purchase, and so forth. While this remains important information to uncover, none of these items represents the reason why a customer will buy your automobile over someone else's. For that reason, one of the primary objectives when you probe and qualify is to gather information concerning what the customer perceives as his needs. Obviously, if you agree that the purpose of a negotiation is to satisfy needs, then you're going to be a lot more successful if you have some idea what those needs are. Like building trust, the process of obtaining information about needs continues throughout the sale. Let me show you something. This is mm -hmm. the seat, if you can kind of picture this as the seat that you are in, to go forward. Oh, isn't that forward. interesting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even here, I could here. drive this, right? <laughs> or, or at least get comfortable <laughs> at in least it, right? get comfortable, right. This is the first year also uh -huh. that the wheel is telescopic. What you're seeing and hearing is a very traditional walk around the car, in which the sales consultant points out all those things that make this automobile the finest production automobile in the world. Unfortunately, the chances are in a traditional walk-around presentation, much of what the sales consultant tells the customer are things that the particular customer doesn't want to hear. And chances are even greater that if the prospect is hearing a lot of things to which he doesn't want to listen, he's tuned out the sales consultant and is busy thinking about something else. What we'd like to do now is take a closer look at the anatomy of a sales situation. Let's start by examining the customer's side of the selling equation. Why do people buy? Because of the price? Well, if you've ever sold cars, you know that price usually appears to be the main issue. However, let me suggest that while price is important, it's not the only issue that must be addressed in a sale. In fact, in many cases, it only becomes an issue after the person has determined that a particular car satisfies his needs. Unfortunately, too many salespeople believe that the price is the only thing that matters to a customer. Of course, it's a major factor, but it's not what motivates a purchase decision. As any good psychologist will tell you, people make purchase decisions based on how well that decision will satisfy a conscious or even subconscious need. The fundamental job of the salesperson in this or in any business is to make sure that the buyer understands how the product or service they offer can satisfy their needs. 
It follows then that the key to successful automobile selling is to develop the ability to identify a customer's needs and then using a combination of product knowledge and selling skills to persuade the prospect that your automobile and your dealership satisfies his needs better than anyone else. Now if you agree that the promised satisfaction of needs is what motivates someone to buy, then it stands to reason that the automobile presentation and demo drive should be focused on proving that the automobile does in fact satisfy the customer's needs. This brings us to the key question. How do you discover a customer's true buying motivation? How do you uncover what a lot of people call the hot button? You'll find the answers to these questions in part B of probing and qualifying, which follows next. We thought this might be a good opportunity to give you a short break, so when you're ready to continue, just restart the tape from this point. We're about to show you a technique that is designed to help you quickly and easily identify the customer's needs or hot buttons. Let's go back to the selling situation we saw earlier and see what this technique looks like in a typical sales encounter. Um, Mr. O'Leary, you've given me a pretty good indication of your driving requirements, but let me ask you uh, one question. What would be your number one uh, demand or priority in a car? Um, dependability. Well, what do you mean by dependability? I mean a, a car that starts when I want it to start, a car that doesn't spend its life in a shop, uh, no surprises. Just for my own curiosity, let me ask you, why did you uh, pick dependability as your number one priority? Because the car I have now is not dependable. I hate it. I mean, it looks gorgeous, but I hate the car because it's, I can't rely on it. It's not dependable. I've got to get back and forth to the office. I've got to get to the patients. And when the car is out, I'm in trouble. And I can't afford that. That's an absurdity. You spend that kind of money for a car, it's got to go when you want it to go. So uh, I agree that's with you. my priority. In case you missed them, the sales consultant posed three questions to the prospects. What would be your number one uh, demand or priority in a car? Um, dependability. Now that's the first question. You can phrase it any way that feels comfortable for you. The key, however, is to get the customer to think about, maybe for the first time, what he or she really wants. What's the number one priority? What's the one thing they have to have in any automobile they buy? Now, you might stop here and assume we've uncovered the hot button, but you want to be sure you understand exactly what he means by dependability. Is he talking service intervals, cold weather starting, operational reliability, or what? So you ask the second question. Well, what do you mean by dependability? I mean a, a car that starts when I want it to start, a car that doesn't spend its life in a shop. Uh, no surprises. Once you're sure you understand what he means by dependability, you move on to the third question. And this one is designed to find out why the customer has selected the particular priority. Just for my own curiosity, let me ask you, why did you uh, pick dependability as your number one priority? Because the car I have now is not dependable. I hate it. I mean, it looks gorgeous, but I hate the car because it's, I can't rely on it. It's not dependable. I've got to get back and forth to the office. I've got to get to the patients. And when the car is out, I'm in trouble. And I can't afford that. That's an absurdity. You spend that kind of money for a car, it's got to go when you want it to go. So uh, I agree that's with you. my priority. As you saw, by asking just three basic questions, the sales consultant was able to get the customer to articulate what he perceived as his primary automotive need. And if the consultant was listening, what he or she really would have heard the customer saying was this, prove to me that your automobile is dependable. Convince me that the price reflects the degree of operational quality that I expect in a Mercedes-Benz. Assure me that the automobile will be one less thing to consume my valuable time. You do all that, and I'll buy your car. Think how much more logical and effective a sales presentation could be if it were organized around proving how a Mercedes-Benz satisfies and even exceeds the prospect's need for dependability in a quality automobile. Now that you know how this three-question probe technique works, the next step is for you to get comfortable with it and make it your own. Think about the three questions and put them into your own words. 
What we suggest is that you practice asking these questions on other people in the dealership or your friends. Then use it on the floor with your customers. You're going to find that in most cases, the customers are so delighted to find someone who's really interested in their needs that they'll give you everything you need to know to make the sale. Further, the fact that you're concerned enough to find out what they want will go a long way toward building long-term rapport. Let me pose a question. Based on what you know about the automobile business, who would you say are Mercedes-Benz main competitors? Chances are you answered BMW, Jaguar, Cadillac, and maybe one or two others. Well, you're right, at least in part. However, you also have some other competitors, and these competitors don't even offer the buyer four wheels and a car key. What these competitors offer is the opportunity to own a yacht, to buy a second home, or take a six-month cruise around the world. To put it another way, if a prospect has forty, fifty, or sixty thousand dollars of discretionary income to spend, there are an awful lot of folks who'd like to attract his attention. One of your challenges is to sell against these alternative purchase options. Another significant challenge is to establish the price-value relationship inherent in a Mercedes-Benz. People aren't going to buy one of our automobiles because they need basic transportation. Their needs go well beyond that. What this means simply is that in the final analysis, the customer is going to have to determine whether the satisfaction of his needs, as represented in the Mercedes-Benz, is worth the price on the sticker. And doing exactly that, not so incidentally, is the objective of the product presentation and demonstration drive. For purposes of illustration, let's say you've determined that the customer's hot button is performance. And by performance, I'm talking about a combination of acceleration, handling, steering precision, braking, and the feel of the total driving experience. Uh, immediately, you've got to determine your presentation strategy. To make that decision, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to tell him about the automobile? Where am I going to start? What am I going to do on the demonstration drive? Now, let me suggest to you that there's no one right answer to these questions. Like the improvisational actor, you're going to have to play it by ear. However, because you know the customer's hot button, you have a track on which to build your sale. Whether you start with the engine or with how the suspension impacts handling, whether you spend five minutes on the floor or 50, everything you talk about, every feature you present, should be tied to performance as the customer perceives it. At this point, you might be asking, what happens when he gets inside the automobile? How do I relate the interior features to performance? Well, as you learn more about each of your automobiles, this will become more evident. But since I've raised the question, let me answer it. There's a science in the automotive industry called ergonomics, which is the study of the relationship between human beings and machines, in this case, an automotive machine. What Mercedes-Benz has done over the years is to work toward the optimum relationship between driver and automobile and this becomes very important to the person interested in performance because performance is more than just the power in the engine or the characteristics of the suspension system it's also the way you feel behind the wheel it's the sense of command of being one with the machine first there's the matter of the seats they're firm supportive and they adjust six different ways this permits the performance-minded customer to find his or her optimum driving position Plus, the firm support reduces driving fatigue. Again, a key benefit to the person who's on a long drive. Next thing you'd point out is how all the controls fall easily to hand. If you're accelerating through curves or overtaking another vehicle, the last thing you need is to go searching for a control. Third, you'd want to point out the instrument cluster and how it's positioned so that with just a minimum drop of the eyes, the driver can read the gauges. Further, you'd point out that analog instrumentation, as opposed to digital, has been shown to be the easiest and fastest means of conveying information to the brain. You might also talk about the black dash area, which is made black to minimize reflection in the window. You could also point out the middle sun visor. And certainly, you'd use this opportunity to talk about how the Mercedes-Benz automatic transmission permits the performance-minded driver to utilize the various gearing levels. Notice how I was able to relate many of the interior features to performance. Once you know your product, 
You could just as easily slant this entire presentation to satisfy a concern for safety or to reinforce the customer's need for quality. Uh, at this point, I'd like to show you examples of sales consultants focusing their sales presentation on the customer's hot button. Let me ask you a couple questions, if I may. Sure. Now, uh, what are you looking for in an automobile? Well, see, I use it for entertaining as well as driving. I do quite a bit of driving because my clients are spaced uh, quite far apart. But then when I do take them to lunch, I want a nice car uh, to represent my agency and my business. Okay. So and I also want something fun to drive. I generally drive sports okay. cars, uh, that type of thing. And I, I've never driven a Mercedes. I don't know how they handle. I heard this handles well. Uh, you know, when you says that you need an automobile to transport clients, you're going to be looking at, what, one client or two or three Primarily clients? it's one. Okay. <clears throat> two or three times a year I'll have a car with two or three people in it. Okay. So I will need a back seat, but if it's a little bit cramped, it's not a big deal because okay. we're only going out to lunch, something like that. If I did a lot of evening entertainment, took people to the show or or dinner, then I would probably want a car larger than the 190, but uh, that hasn't happened. Okay, so space, the, the, the ability to carry uh, one or more passengers mm -hmm. is important to you. You want an automobile that is going to handle and fun it's going to be fun to drive. Right. And because you're new in the advertising, well, not new to you, how long have you been in the business yourself? But well, uh, just since last November. Okay, so you want an automobile that's going to project, you know, uh, some prestige that's going to mm -hmm. show that, hey, I am successful. Okay. So those basic Without are being ostentatious. Exactly. Right? <laughs> okay. Because if you wanted that, of course, you'd get into something, you know, uh, considerably larger. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start here, number one. Uh, the 190, be it gas or diesel, you're how tall? Six one and a half. Okay. This will give you an idea of the kind of interior space that, that, that you would have in the automobile. Mm -hmm. Being that you like an automobile that is a, has some type of a sports car feel and quality, mm -hmm. do you think you'd be leaning more towards a, a standard <coughs> or an automatic? Probably, yeah. Okay. That wouldn't present a problem to you in, in transporting people or clients around? But I wanted to show you, if I may, uh, no in your travels, if you're going to be going for an extended journey or somewhere, or even if you have to take three or four clients somewhere, it's important that you have a good usable trunk space mm -hmm. here. It's a good size trunk for this yeah. car. And they give you a full size spare all the way down. Mm -hmm. That's why when, when people buy a Mercedes, they buy a Benz because when, they, when they're, they're buying quality and it just it, it projects something when someone has a Mercedes-Benz. There's an individual who, number one, knows what he wants, who's deeply concerned with an automobile that's going to perform well, and it's going to last a long time. But to get the handling, to get the stopping ability, to get the, the handling in the wet, as well as the drawing, they found mm -hmm. that this was the best combination. They did some mm -hmm. extensive research and development on a new rear suspension. It's a multi-link rear suspension. Yeah, I heard something about that. This automobile here, is, as I said earlier, is the kind of automobile you can get into and you can throw around. Yes, I just assumed, you know, you get sedan, you get, you get four doors that you're not going to get, it's not going to handle as well because it's starting to get too big. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as it handles well, I don't really care. We'd probably be better off with a four door. With either one of these cars, the 190 or the 300, you have state-of-the-art suspension. In terms of handling, they're both very high performance in that regard. The 300 is going to be a considerably faster car than the 190. Everything's very functional. It's very pure. And again, it goes back to being a sports sedan. It gives you the feeling of being in command of the car. All the Mercedes seats are made out of real coil springs. They're real stuff. They're all te technically, orthopedically designed. They are not a full bucket like you're accustomed to, but they give you good support on mm -hmm. your sides here. Yeah. Again, and it's got these, again, it comes uh, back to the sports things. sedan. They know that you're going to be doing some maneuvering with the car. You're going to need some lateral support. But they also know that you're going to be taking long trips on it and driving around town as a luxury car, too. It's a very happy medium between a sports car and a luxury car. Your sports car feel is that when you look off the windshield area, down into the upper hub of the wheel, the gauges line up perfectly in there. It's all related to you are in charge of driving the car. Let me inject a thought here. 
Just because a person elects performance as his number one requirement, he may also have other important buying motivations. For that reason, probing for needs never really stops, nor does the listening. In the course of conversation, you might learn that the customer is concerned about resale value or safety or the quality of the sound system. These are all needs, and while the main thrust is to satisfy the primary buying motivation, you'll also want to show how the automobile addresses these secondary needs. Obviously, the more needs you can identify and then satisfy, the more likely you'll be to increase the customer's perception of the inherent value in the automobile. And to put it another way, you're adding more evidence to support the contention that the sticker price does in fact reflect the worth of the automobile. At some point during the sale, and it'll be different with each customer, your presentation track will take you from the floor to the demonstration drive. Essentially, the demo drive is an extension of the floor presentation. The major goal remains the same, to prove that the automobile satisfies the customer's needs and that its value is equal to the price. In most cases, customers are going to jump at the opportunity to drive a Mercedes. However, in some cases, moving the customer from the floor to the demo drive may present more of a challenge. The question is, how do you handle this type of situation? It's real easy. Come on, let's take a drive in this, and you just start walking. And they follow just like a puppy dog. It's whatever you want a customer to do. If you just say, come on, let's go do this, and you don't wait for a response, you just immediately turn around. 99% of the time, when you turn around and look back, they're going to be right behind you. You can sit there, come on, let's go throw snowballs outside. And if you take off, they're going to follow you. If they don't, then you haven't done a job before that to get them to follow you. You have to maintain control, is what it all comes down to. Okay, so your prospect is ready for the demo drive. Now you face the next question, and this is one that you should have answered long before you meet your first customer. Where do you go on the demo drive? In part, the answer may be determined by your dealership location and the customer's time. However, in general, you should have two or three predetermined demo routes to choose from. Each, ideally, should lend itself to reinforcing the focus of our presentation. While no two demo drives are going to be the same, there are nonetheless some fundamental do's that you'll want to keep in mind. For example, you should always prepare the customer for his or her turn behind the wheel by taking a few moments to familiarize them with the basic controls. In addition, you should help the customers adjust the seating to ensure that it's set to their liking. At this point, we're going to show you several excerpts from three different demo rides. As you'll see, much of what the consultant says and does is determined by the customer's questions and responses to the automobile. The bottom line is that the demo ride is going to be as different as the personalities themselves. A demo ride, a lot of times I will take the wheel first and go out and do a few things, show the turning diameter, get away from traffic, turn the wheel over to the customer a few minutes later. Uh, the most important thing that I do with, on a demo ride is I get the customer off of talking about a car. I take them down Braddy Lane, show them, oh, aren't the trees pretty, isn't the weather nice, whatever, and make them feel at ease. Stop talking about the car. And then five or ten minutes later, after just chit-chat talk, you know, do you know John Jones or that kind of stuff? What street do you live on? If you know somebody else live on the street, you try to, oh, I sold him a car. After five or ten minutes, then you turn to him and say, how does the car feel? And it's like, oh, I'm driving your car. feels great. They feel relaxed driving the car. When you take somebody out, they usually feel tense driving a $25,000, $30,000, $50,000 car. And you have to make them feel at ease. I remember when I first came to Benzel Bush as a salesman, I had my first Mercedes-Benz demo. And it was just such a wonderful feeling when I picked that car up, driving home in it, you know. The wood looks great. Everything is new. It's just a wonderful feel to it. You have a thick steering wheel. There's something to grab onto. And I just really try to sit back and let the customer gain that, gain that same sense of the car that I did the first time out. I think sometimes I have a tendency for take, to take for granted how good the car actually is. You can't do that, though, OK? Sometimes you 
have to point out a little bit, remember, look at the quality of the finish on this wood. There's no other car quite like that. But mostly I let the people try to feel comfortable in the car, let them picture themselves as owning the car, and what it just feels like to hold on to that Mercedes-Benz steering wheel and drive the car, surrounded with all of that comfort. I had mentioned to you before, Lynn, when you buy a car from, you can make it right here, mm -hmm. from Contemporary, you are in fact buying the entire complex. Okay, let me ask you something. Uh, when I bring the car in for service, do I get a loaner car? Yes. Now the loaner car, Where Lynn, going straight. straight. And we'll go all the way down to the end of this road. Okay. The loaner car, uh, Lynn, is something that I specifically do for, uh, for my customers. Um, the dealership is not involved in loaner cars just for the amount of them that they would have to have. Uh, mm -hmm. They'd have to have 75 loaner cars. Yeah. But as, a, as an independent, as a, as a businessman myself, yeah. uh, I've got two cars that are on the premise at all times for my customers to use. Okay. So when you do arrange service, pick up the phone, call me. We will then arrange a day that's convenient for both of us and you'll be provided with a car okay. at, no, at no charge to you. Okay. okay, that's something that I do for my customers. I think one of the first things you'll notice on, this, uh, on the SDL is how quiet the engine is. You know, it's, let me shut down the air just for a minute. This is a cold engine. You know, this is at a cold operating temperature. It's at its noisiest, and it's quiet even now. Yeah, it is quiet. Yeah. Uh, Quite a bit quiet, more quiet than my car is. Okay. How's the car seem? What I'm most impressed about driving it is I don't hear a rattle in the place. It's a nice, <laughs> tight feel. The car that I own mm -hmm. is 12 years old. Right. It's amazing how tight the car still is. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's Have you ever owned a Mercedes-Benz before? No. no, I've driven them many times. You'll enjoy it. In theory, once you've uncovered the prospect's hot button, his buying motivation, and focused your sales presentation on proving that your automobile satisfies his needs, you should be able to move directly to the close. Notice I said in theory. Sometimes it works that way. However, chances are that at some point during the sale, the buyer will begin to raise objections. Usually these objections occur when you're about to get into the subject of price. You should understand that there are really two different categories of objections in our business. The first we call stated objections. Uh, I appreciate the small discount that you threw at me. It's still really just a little more than I wanted to spend. I don't, I am not using this as a threat or anything, but I would like you to be aware that it's, whatever we negotiate here, I will certainly shop, I will be shopping around at other Mercedes dealerships with, you know, I know you don't have time, but I will be doing it on my own just to see what is there any value of, shop around. I mean, is there honestly any value of doing that? Are, are we going to save, if, if we're talking, we're a couple thousand dollars away from what the best is that you folks can offer, can we actually, is there any value in doing it? Probably not. I just assume that they're going to be priced about the same. The, you it's will, you it's will my find. leg work and I, and I am born to shop. In these cases, there's no question what the objection is. The second category is called implied objections. These are usually disguised in the form of excuses, such as... No, I like it so far. I, I do want to, you know, take the brochures home and, mm -hmm. and think about it. And Off the top of my head, uh, my wife has to approve, of course. I'm still going to have to go to my accountant. Check this. Oh, I understand that. One thing we know for sure about the implied objection is that underneath the excuse is an unstated objection. More often than not, at the root of this implied objection is the price of the car. Having said that, we should caution you that sometimes what appears to be an implied objection is actually a legitimate request. For example, if someone were to say, I want to shop around and see where I can get the best rate on an auto loan. That could be a legitimate statement, or it could be the customer's way of telling you that he'd like to shop some other dealership and see if he can get a better price or more for his trade-in. One way to test for a hidden price objection is to suggest that the customer might want to consider a lower-priced model. If you step them down a notch and they seem more comfortable with the price, then you know the source of the objection. Keep in mind, however, that you also want to ensure that the customer saves face. 
For that reason, you mask the step down with a benefit statement. If they're, say, for instance, looking at a 420, and I feel them just backing away, knowing that the price is a little bit too much for them, I'll tell them, say, you know, if you're really not comfortable with that size car, maybe I should suggest to you, you know, even considering a 300 series and go into, it costs you X number of dollars to get into that series, rather than ever embarrassing them by saying, you know, let me suggest a lesser price car to you. In this example, the step down sounds more like a concern on the part of the sales consultant that he hadn't fully exposed the customer to all the options. Possibly the best advice we can give you in dealing with customer objections is to take the statement at face value and assume that what the customer is telling you is true. At the same time, you should be listening for signals that would indicate a hidden objection. In either case, be it a stated or implied objection, your task is to answer objections and remove them as obstacles to the sale and continue the process of proving that the price is equal to the car's ability to satisfy the buyer's needs. Now, we recognize that even the best sales consultant is not going to be able to overcome every objection. Some people are going to object to the price because it's simply more than they can afford, or because they haven't as yet been convinced that the value of the car and its capacity to satisfy their needs is equal to the price. To give you some more insight into this critical aspect of selling, we've asked several Mercedes-Benz sales consultants to tell us how they deal with these two types of objections. Off the top of my head, uh, my wife has to approve, of course. If we've narrowed down to a model or anything, and many times you actually narrow down to a particular car, I'll say, take it to your wife and show it to her. And I, again, you turn right around, you, go, you say, I'm going to go get a tag for you. You turn right around, you do it. And in that case, a lot of times they do stop you dead in your tracks. They say, oh, my wife isn't home, or I can't get to her, or something like that. Uh, at that point, there's not a whole. It, it, there's really not a whole lot you can do. At that point, you just say, "Bring your wife back," or if you want, I'll go call me up. I'll go show the car to your wife for you. And a lot of times, husbands like that. Husbands like the salesman to take the car and sell the idea to his wife. Um, I offer to suggest that they could bring their wife in, or if they want to, we can take the car to their wife and pick up the wife. We have an extended program so that we can send the car out for a couple of hours. Well, back up on that one. Uh, or any objection really as you are with the customer during the presentation, during the demo drive, by asking questions for the common stall techniques that the customers use, uh, early on in the presentation, these objections usually will not come up. So you handle them before they become objections. For example, on that one, you can ask them uh, early on while you're taking the demo drive, for example, is there anyone else that's going to be helping you make this decision? Now, if they say, yes, my wife, well, at that point, you can say, great, it's, where is she now? If she's home or at the office and it's local, why don't we take the test drive and drive over there and let her see the car? I'm still going to have to go to my account. Check this. Oh, I understand that. Okay, same with the accountant. Uh, you can ask, when you asked the question earlier, is there anyone else who's going to help you make this decision? He would have said that. Now, if they don't answer you with that, chances are they won't use that as an objection later on. We always encourage them to do that rather than saying, well, no, let me, let me act as your accountant. You don't want to ever give anybody the impression that you know more than their paid professional. No, I like it so far. I, I do want to, you know, take the brochures home and, mm -hmm. and think about it. Okay. First, I try to clarify what they're going to think about. And I, I start over and selling again, you know. Was there something in particular that I missed? Um, was there a question that you had that maybe we could work out? And then I just start reselling until I really find out what the real hesitation is. Either I go back to step one and really ask them to take another drive in the car. Or at that point, I will volunteer. I'll sit there and say, you know, do you have to consult your wife before you make a decision? I'll try to find out what's holding him up from making a decision. And sometimes I'll just come dead out and say, what, why, what do you have to make a decision about? Is it about this, another model, another make car, whatever? And again, you draw from that, and a lot of times I go back and start the whole presentation all over again. Um, I will say that when we get down to this point, let us not let price be the most important thing. Let's remember that you are buying the most prestigious automobile in the world. You're also having a, a very large dealer backup at this dealership. 
Yes, Dana. I will, I, and I don't, I am not using this as a threat or anything, but I would like you to be aware that it's, whatever we negotiate here, I will certainly, shop, I will be shopping around at other Mercedes dealerships with, you know, I know you don't have time, but I will be doing it on my own just to see what, is there any value? I, shop I mean, is there honestly any value of doing that? Are, are we going to save, if, if we're talking, we're a couple thousand dollars away from what the best is that you folks can offer. Mm -hmm. Can we actually, is there any value in doing it? Probably not. I just assume that they're going to be priced about the same. That you it's will, you it's will my find. leg work, and I, and I am born to shop. Sure. <laughs> well, what we always recommend is I'll encourage you to make some phone calls. If you find, for any reason, they were out of line at all, just call I us. I will come back. I, I certainly sure. will. Sure. Because, you know, sometimes the market will shift. We normally find that we're very competitive because we do a, a large volume of business here. And we also have to consider, since you do live in the district and you are coming out to the, our dealership, we do find that we're probably the most convenient. We have the award-winning shop in the area, and we're the only one that can boast of the award-winning shop. It means nothing to you now because what you're thinking of is your, your money. But when you really start thinking of service, you're going to maybe feel that even if you paid a, a few hundred dollars more to do business here, it was money well spent. I would like to get something, you know, as I say, I only live about half a mile from here, so we'd obviously like something that's easy right. to service, easy to deal with, but I would like to talk to, you know, some of the other Mercedes dealers and just see... Uh, I understand you know, completely. I mean, I don't know if, this, if each dealership, you may have a, you know, they're trying to push certain cars. They We're have all very, very or, close. What it really comes down to is you live a half mile away. I've been here for 10 years. I have three loaner cars on the road all the time for servicing, which is free. You mean if I have to bring this car in for service, you give me another yes. car? Yeah. As long free. as you give me a call four or five days ahead of time, you get another car. We meet you here at 8.30 in the morning, and then you bring it back at between 5 and 6 in the evening or even yeah. a little bit later. The last question you ask, is it the price? Yes. Is it me? Is it the dealership? Is it the product? Is it the location? Is it the price? Generally, they're going to answer no to everything except the price. And then you start all over again. Let me add some thoughts on how you can increase your chances for success in dealing with the implied objection. Oftentimes, as you heard from our salespeople, the implied objection masks the unwillingness to tell you that they want to shop for a better price or that they simply can't afford it. Assuming that you've built up some trust and rapport with the customer, you may find a question like, is there more information you need? will help you uncover the real objection. How blunt you are in your probing depends on both your personality and that of the customer. The bottom line is that the only way you can deal with this situation is by encouraging the customer to open up and be candid. You've got to convey an attitude that says, I'm here to help you drive home in the car of your choice. The closer you can get to the customer, the more you can make him feel that you're someone who will work with him, the better your chances of getting at the truth and working through the problems. Question, what's the most difficult part of the sale? For most new sales consultants, the most difficult part of the sale is asking for the order. And the reason is simple. They don't want to suffer a turndown. They don't want to face up to the rejection. Well, we can't do much to prevent an occasional turndown. However, we can help you develop a more effective and confident approach to the process of closing the sale. In this segment, we're going to talk about when to close. Then we're going to see some examples of what we call the trial close. And finally, we're going to explore various closing techniques. When do you close? In general, it can be said that you close as soon as the prospect is in agreement that the Mercedes-Benz satisfies his needs. This can happen virtually any time during the sale. If there's one rule to keep in mind, it's this. When the customer is ready to buy, let him. Even if you're in the middle of the sales presentation, too often, salespeople keep selling when they should be closing. To put it another way, don't talk beyond the sale. This leads to the next question. How do you determine if a prospect is ready to close? Basically, there are three ways. First, listen for buying signals. Let the customer tell you when he or she is ready. Be alert for comments or questions that indicate the customer is ready to buy. Now this is what you're going to, to enjoy about this particular car, is the, the leg room in the back seat. 
if you want to have a seat in there. That is huge. Well, I wouldn't expect to sit in the back, but it'd be nice for someone sure. to ask. This is terrific. God, this is wonderful. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I've decided I want the large one. Okay. But I'm going to pay most of it, I think. Uh, You're going to pay most of it? Point here. If, uh, I would just like to make the point that my heart probably would lie in that car, and if I'm giving in on this situation, perhaps the next time we buy brownie points? <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> How about color selection? Maybe we'll let Dana change, change, choose the color. There you go. <laughs> Black looks awfully nice. Black looks nice. I, I, mean, I guess I don't have any choice in that. Right. Does I it mean, come it, in this kind of gray? It's automatic transmission, period. Automatic, Oh, yes. sure. Because I've always driven as, as a standard shift, and right. I love it. Yes, it's automatic. Not for this kind this of car. car. I know. You like this gray? I like this color with the stripes. It's called <laughs> smoke silver. Smoke silver is... Silver. It looks like a, it looks right. like a silver gold. It's okay. a silver taupe, I think. Would that come in that light silver with this light gray? I want this car. I don't want to spend this much money. A second opportunity for closing occurs after you've made the presentation and taken the demo drive. Assuming the prospect has had a positive reaction to the car, the time has come to ask for the order. The third opportunity for closing is created with trial closes. The trial close is a question, or series of questions, designed to probe the prospect's readiness to buy without forcing him or her to make a purchase decision. Here's how some experienced sales consultants use the trial close. Any question that you can ask that elicits a positive response, uh, for example, you take them to the lot and you show them your inventory and you show them a particular color, do you like this color? Yes. No. Well, if they say no, well, which one do you like? My trial close is, you know you can take it with you today. You can treat yourself to the new car today. That's my trial close. And from that, you watch for the body language and what they say. Some of them go, really? And when they say really, then you know you got a live one. Because that's like his mind's starting to click and he's thinking, boy, maybe I really can get it today. Uh, then you get the other guys, no, I don't want it for six months. So that, that tells you something there. But that's my trial close. It's the best trial close in the world to me. Will you be trading in the 300D or? How's the car seat? How soon did you want a car? In summary, then, the trial close is a question, or questions, designed to help you determine how close the prospect is to making a buying decision. It's also a means to motivate the customer into making a series of positive decisions and choices which, if they relate to the prospect's hot button, will help reinforce the buying decision. Now we come to the actual close. Ideally, if you've identified the customer's hot button, the buying motivation, and taking the time in the floor presentation and demo drive to prove that your car satisfies his needs, you have earned the right to close. As with every aspect of selling, there are any number of closing strategies and techniques. The most common technique is called the direct close. As the name suggests, this is where you candidly ask for the order. Here's an example. If I can get this price approved here, <clears throat> will you buy the car? Lynn, um, I want to be as competitive to you and the company as, mm -hmm. as, what, the, as what the market bears mm -hmm. on a car that is in very, very much demand. I'm prepared to sell you a 300E okay. at $37,000. Normally, you use the direct close when you feel confident that the customer is ready to buy and there are no obstacles standing in the way of his or her decision. The second technique is the summary close. Here the objective is to summarize all the reasons why the car satisfies the customer's needs. In essence, what you want to say would go something like this. Mr. Customer, you told me performance is your number one priority. Let me remind you of all the performance features in this car. And at that point, you'd summarize the key performance features. Here's an example of this technique in practice. I'd like to see an event. I really would. I, I think that's going to do it for it. It's got, it's got the prestige that you're looking for. It's got the room that you're looking for. It's got the handling that you're looking for. Yep. 
Yeah, that was a super ride. It wasn't, yeah, it's, well, it wasn't it's, stiff. And you know the nice part about it, it's an excellent compromise with regards to ride and handling. I mean, when we were going through those, those the twisties down there, um, you get a little bit of a smile on your face. And mm -hmm. it, uh, it handled well. I could see that. You, you were enjoying the automobile. No, I was. There was no question about it. And that's that. very important. That's one of the things, uh, of the three things that you know, you're, you're looking for. Um, that seems to be number one. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two are important, but perhaps not as important as, as you being able to go quickly with the car and enjoy the automobile. In that close, there were three key elements. First, a summary of the prospect's needs as he himself has identified them. Second, a summary of the car's benefits as they relate to and satisfy his needs. And finally, an effort to get the prospect to agree that they do satisfy his needs. After that, you ask for the order. A third closing technique is designed for the reserved, laid-back, reluctant types. The people who either can't make up their minds or seem afraid to make a decision. This is called the assumptive close. Now, this method is designed to force the prospect to act or make a decision by default. To put it another way, you simply proceed as though you assume the prospect wants to buy the car. What you're doing is giving him the task of stopping you if he doesn't want to go through with the purchase. Here's an example. Order's sitting right here. It comes out, it comes out just like this. And you start writing. Usually if you have a husband and wife situation, you show them the price, they look at each other, you can tell they're ready to buy the car, you immediately pull it out, and you go, what name do you want it to be titled in? Boom, that's it. Let me give you several more examples of how you might set up the assumptive close. One, begin filling in the order form. Two, if the customer is interested in leasing, offer to introduce him to the leasing manager. Three, call the sales manager and have him approve the appraisal. Four, ask the prospect to fill in some financing, leasing, or credit forms. In each instance, you will have created a positive action that has the effect of initiating the close of the sale. As you become more experienced, you're going to develop your own style of closing, and you're going to find that it varies depending on the situation and the customer. The main thing to keep in mind is to always ask for the order. Time and again, people in our business let a prospect who has been mostly sold walk away without being asked to buy. All too often, the difference between a lost prospect and a sale lies in the asking. At Mercedes-Benz, we take the process of turning the car over to the customer very seriously. In fact, the actual delivery should be as well-planned and executed as your best sales presentation. Because the fact of the matter is that a good delivery may well be your next sales presentation. Let me elaborate on that. I think it goes without saying that taking delivery of a new Mercedes-Benz is a very special moment for most customers. For you, it's a very special opportunity. Consider this. Mercedes-Benz of North America spends millions of dollars on advertising, and your dealership adds tens of thousands more. But during the delivery, you have one of the best opportunities in the world to advertise yourself. Best of all, it doesn't cost you a dime. And the payback? Well, by some estimates, every good delivery will generate three additional sales through referrals from the customer. For the sake of argument, let's say it generates only one sale. That could mean you double your sales figures every year. Those are the kinds of sales returns that no advertising campaign could hope to match. And that makes about as good a case as I can think of for putting maximum effort into the delivery. This brings us to a key question. What constitutes a good delivery? In the simplest terms, it's comprised of thorough preparation, an intelligent, professional presentation of the car, and a conscientious post-delivery follow-up. We're not going to try and give you a step-by-step -step primer on how to deliver cars. What we are going to do is give you an opportunity to share some of the thoughts and techniques used by other sales consultants. Let's start with the preparation or the pre-delivery phase. In addition to the pre-delivery inspection form, some dealerships have their own formal checklist that sales consultants use before each delivery. The check uh, list we go through is uh, nowhere near as technical as a mechanic would go through on a PDI, but it is all the main things, uh, ingredients uh, that a customer would, uh, are the lights working, does the car, the car perform well? I even want the clock set. 
uh, our, uh, is a first aid kit in the car. Uh, tire pressures, a salesman will even many times check his own tire pressures. I've got uh, quite a few of the guys will do that. So when the car pulls out of here, it rides good, it feels good, everything is working. There's nothing worse to me than having somebody pull out of here and have something go wrong with that new Mercedes Benz. Uh, that was our fault. Uh, not that something mechanical broke, but even a lighter missing kind of takes away from uh, this whole wonderful thing of this person picking up his first Mercedes Benz or his tenth. It's very important that if we've made an appointment to deliver a vehicle at 9.30 tomorrow morning, that that car is ready at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Probably the most important thing that I do prior to a delivery is to take some time out, personally going over every car that I've delivered here at this agency. Uh, I take it upon myself to get the proper uh, lubricants to remove any spots or stains that may have been left by the detail people. Uh, personally, I like to go over all the woodwork to polish it to a very high finish so there are no fingerprints on there, wiping off all the chrome in the interior, and just going over the automobile, just making sure it's spotless, representative of an automobile that I personally would like to take delivery of, and a car of this caliber. Uh, I think a Mercedes automobile is an exception. Uh, it's not the rule, and people are anticipating a little bit more than they would be if they were buying a domestic car or even some of our other European competition. One of the things also I do is I find out what kind of musical taste they have if, when I sell them the car. And prior to delivery, when I'm demonstrating the radio, I'll pre-program in the stations they like into the radio. Before the delivery, just make sure that we or that I am prepared uh, as far as paperwork. I'm the last person to inspect the car and make sure the items that should be there are there that the car has been uh, totally cleaned and dusted and we don't even like any dust on the car. You have to be up. You have to feel up. You have to feel good about the way everything is prepared, the way the car looks, about your preparation for the, for the deal, actual delivery itself. And when the people come in, they can feel it. They see the cars out there waiting for them. They see the paperwork is on the desk and there's nothing else. They can feel it. And if you're up, if you're feeling good about everything, it comes right off the customer. To sum up, you've got to take the time to get prepared. Otherwise, you could end up undoing the professional in-control image that you created during the sale. The message here is to personally check both the car and the paperwork well before the customer arrives. Now let's move on to the delivery itself. In addition to walk-around orientation to the car, a good presentation is a combination of attitude, time, and a touch of theatrics. I guess number one, I try to be excited about the delivery, and that's usually not too hard for me to do. Um, uh, and just be as excited as the customer is picking up the car. It, it, it's my attitude towards them. I'm, I'm ex excited, I'm very excited about delivering that car, not half as excited as they are about picking up their car. It, it, it's a tremendous step for anybody at, and at any level. The car has been prepared correctly, I've given them as much time as is needed to present the car to them properly. Attitude, 100%. I'm excited about delivering that automobile to them. Well, the, the first thing that we like in the delivery, when the person comes, we like them to know that this time is allotted for them. And so when they come in, the desks are cleared off, and the only thing that's on their desk is the papers for the delivery. They know at this time that the delivery is allotted, the time is for them. And I want to make sure they feel special. They feel that I feel it's special. And I really, really stress a very thorough delivery. I don't like to rush through it. There's no rush. The sale is made. And they're my customer, and I want to make sure that they are totally satisfied. The most important element, uh, I would have to say, is simply uh, that the customer fully understands what he got, that he appreciates what he got and that he is reinforced in the decision that he made. Let's face it, it's not an easy decision to spend from twenty to sixty thousand dollars almost on an automobile. And he has to be made comfortable that he made the right decision, which fortunately the product we have uh, really helps us do that. I kind of like to deliver them off the floor if I can, because how many times can you in a lifetime drive a brand new Mercedes Benz right off the showroom? That to me is exciting. It's an exciting product, it's an exciting moment, 
and to drive out the doors in your new Mercedes-Benz, I think, is a very, very exciting thing. When the, the customer, we're just about to say goodbye to him. We went over the automobile again. Uh, he's got his keys. Uh, he's familiar with the controls on the automobile. Uh, at that point, he thinks he's going to be pulling out the driveway and saying goodbye. The salesman says, jumps in the back seat and said, drive the car around the building. Still not telling him what we're going to do. We pull up to the uh, gas pumps. We fill the tank up for him. What happens there is, uh, yeah, I've had cust the, the customers, after we, get, after we get to know them a little bit, uh, customers, uh, the comments they've made to me said, gee, Tony had my money or uh, Al Smith had my money and uh, the car was all paid for, the paperwork was all done, and he still gave me a tank of gas. And that was from him. To me, filling up the tank in front of the customer is an excellent example of delivery theatrics. Frankly, the more you can incorporate this kind of technique, the more memorable the delivery will be for the customer. Believe me, it will give them something to talk about. Once the delivery has been made, you'll want to make follow-up calls several days later to be sure that the customer is fully satisfied. The key thing to keep in mind is that follow-up not only assures you of seeing that customer at some time in the future, but it's one of the best ways to uncover leads to other people in the market for a Mercedes-Benz. Last question. Does all this effort pay off? Probably the people in the best position to answer that are the customers themselves. Um, the way they handled us, the way they treated us uh, as individuals purchasing uh, a piece of equipment, basically, was a little different than anything else I've experienced with car dealers uh, in that they've made us feel as important as the vehicle we were buying. And uh, the way they delivered the car to us, um, the first time I ever picked up an automobile at a dealership with a full tank of gas, for instance, and as clean as it was and as well prepared as it was, just made me feel like it was something special. With both of our cars, at least a couple of days after, and I had never had it to happen before, but our salesman sent me beautiful, beautiful flowers and a nice letter thanking us and, oh, the flowers were just gorgeous. And each year, well, I've only had that one both not even a year yet, but at Christmas time I received a lovely card from the service department and from my salesman and they're just great. I had never before had flowers sent to me for buying a car and I thought that was just great. I wouldn't go to anybody else even though I could have done a little better on the car from someone else. I have referred three of my friends to Scott within the last month. I would not go, I wouldn't save $1,000 on another car by going to a different dealership. Let me put it that way. And by putting it that way, I think he said all that needs to be said in summing up why it's to your advantage to make the most of each delivery and follow-up effort. Now, this concludes your orientation program. We recognize that we've given you a great deal of information in a very short time. For that reason, we recommend that you look at all or selected parts of this program again. The sooner you master your product knowledge and the sales techniques we presented, the sooner you'll be realizing the special success that comes from selling Mercedes-Benz automobiles. Good luck. <laughs>